All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to do things a little bit differently this week. I've got some things that have come up, and I'm going to attend to them tonight. So today I'll be recording this uh, lecture um, here at Aletheia, and we'll be, stream we'll be streaming it to you uh, at your leisure, wherever it is that you are. Uh, so uh, hopefully uh, you'll be able to view that, and then we'll uh, I'll post it in the uh, in the classwork section there, and and uh, be, feel free to comment as, as you desire. Uh, I'll be checking those comments to respond back to them to see if there, there are any questions or anything that, um, that I can answer. Well, today we're going to be looking at the Old Testament book of Numbers, the Old Testament book of Numbers. And, um, and uh, Numbers is uh, an interesting place in the, in the canon. <clears throat> now, we, we, we've gone through Genesis, which gives the beginnings of all things, Exodus, which details the, the exodus of, of the Hebrew people from, from uh, slavery and bondage in Egypt. Uh, we've moved from there on to Leviticus, where they have gathered at Sinai. They've heard from the Lord. Uh, they've received his law. They've received a, you know, a rebuke or two as well. Um, and God is shepherding them and, uh, and, you know, in, into, uh, to, to, to be a nation. And he's laying down some laws, both uh, moral laws and case laws and uh, various things that they are to do as a people to separate them from the peoples that surround them. Uh, we looked a little bit at Leviticus last time uh, where we saw that, that uh, holiness is, is uh, what God requires of his people. Holiness not, in this, not just in the sense of being, uh, being morally righteous, but holiness also in the sense that they are to be separate from the peoples around them. Um, so anyhow, uh, today we're going to look at the next book of, uh, of, of the Pentateuch, which is the book of Numbers. Now, Numbers uh, is, is sort of a, a climax of sorts. Um, it kind of reminds me when I, was, uh, when I was young and I was very much into, into Star Wars. When Star Wars first came out, I can remember seeing that, uh, being very interested in it, <clears throat> you know, having the books and the action figures and the toys and things like this. Um, uh, Star Wars was the first movie, but when the Empire Strikes Out, uh, Empire Strikes Back came out, um, we, we went to see that. Of course, because of the popularity of the first movie, uh, the Empire Strikes Back exploded. People were just lining up around uh, movie theaters. I remember standing in line, kind of like a uh, like a ride at Disney, you know, standing in line uh, for for hours to to go see the movies, uh, to go see that movie. And I I was young at that time. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but I remember watching the movie and thinking to myself, you know, if you're familiar with the plot line, The Empire Strikes Back represents a very low point in the, in the, uh, the storyline of the movie, right? Uh, the, the series, if you will. Um, you know, it looks like, the, you know, when it ends, it looks like the good guys uh, are, 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 you know, have, the, have everything going against them. The bad guys have uh, everything, uh, you know, tied down and, and this sort of thing. Looks like they're going to win. Well, Numbers it kind of is like that in terms of the Pentateuch. Um, you know, we, we start out kind of at a low point where, they're, where the Hebrew people are in bondage in, in Egypt, and they come out triumphantly and they gather, and yes, there's some problems, uh, pro pretty severe problems, some of them are. But nonetheless, God brings them through that. God forgives them. He reestablishes his covenant. And we get to the book of Leviticus, and you've got you, you've got the people who are um, they are uh, receiving the law, and and, and uh, it looks like they finally might have gotten it together. And and by the beginning of the book of Numbers, you have what we see is uh, sort of a very optimistic high point in, uh, in 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 his, in the history of the Hebrews here. And for the first ten chapters or so, we'll look at that in just a moment. But the first ten chapters or so, things are looking great. Uh, more or less. So anyway, we'll look at that in just a moment. But let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the uh, introductory type of material for the Book of Numbers. Uh, so we have uh, it, this is the Book of Numbers. Of course, um, uh, at least that's the title of the book in our English translation. In the Hebrew, if you were to translate it in the Hebrew or from the Hebrew, the book of the name for the Book of Numbers, or what we call the Book of Numbers literally means into the wilderness. Now, this is, uh, this is sort of a, a, an ironic title, if you will. <clears throat> and the reason being is because when, we, when we're leading out of the book of Leviticus, 
uh, the people are getting ready, and, and, and the assumption is they're going to get ready, and they're going to be headed to the promised land pretty soon. And uh, so it's not; it shouldn't be into the wilderness. It should be into the promised land so that they could go and conquer the promised land uh, and receive the promise that God had promised to their forefather, Abraham. Uh, he, he had promised Abraham that he would make Abraham a, a father of many nations and that many people, many descendants would come from Abraham. And, of course, it looks like God is fulfilling that promise. Uh, God had promised Abraham that his people would go into slavery and into bondage and, and then be led out after that. And God has been faithful to do that by a mighty hand, by, de by a demonstration of power, uh, uh, by the plagues he exercised upon Egypt and also the mighty deliverance to the Red Sea where he destroys the army of the world power of the day. And, 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 and uh, it, by, by leading them into the into Sinai and, and receiving the law, hearing directly from God, knowing without a doubt that God is there. Um, and and uh, he, has, he has another promise yet to fulfill, though, and that is the promise of the land. And the, the promise specifically of the land that he had shown Abraham when he says, Abraham, uh, lift up your eyes and look. Everywhere you see will be yours and your descendants forever. As an inheritance, and and so uh, and so that that promise has yet to be fulfilled. Well, the Israelites know this, and they are they, they are you know it, it, they are expecting now God has fulfilled all these other promises that they will receive the land that God has promised their forefathers. Um, and so one would think at the beginning of the book of Numbers that uh, that, that we have a great expectation of of going into the in, into the land. Of, of capturing the land and of receiving finally the fulfillment of the promise that God has given to his people. Um, but the book in Hebrew is called Into the Wilderness. And so right off the bat, we begin from the beginning, and we can tell that something has gone horribly wrong uh, with this, with, with what's going on here. So the title is, is Numbers. In the Hebrew, it's, it's Into the Wilderness. Uh, the author, again, is Moses. And uh, he, he, again, authors the, the vast majority of the Pentateuch, with the possible exception of that which records his own death. Uh, the date is around 1400 B.C. Uh, 14, well, it's 1446 B.C. to about 1400 B.C. So the, the, it spans some time uh, because it, it begins really about a year after the Exodus takes place and then spans some time of the wilderness wanderings as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the setting is primarily in the wilderness, um, and uh, and really sort of a a key phrase that would encompass uh, the, the the general message of the book of Numbers is that this is God fulfilling His promise. This is God fulfilling His promise. He is in the process of fulfilling all of the promises that He has given to Abraham, or given to Israel through Abraham. All right. We're going to dive right in, and uh, we're going to look at, in some cases, a, a chapter by chapter, uh, with, with something of significance that we need to look at here. Uh, but I will be skipping through some of the material because, again, this is a survey class. But to give a general sort of outline of the book, we've got Numbers 1 and 2. Uh, in, in Numbers 1 and 2, God commands the, the Israelites to take a census of all the men who are 30 years and, uh, and over. And uh, basically, uh, this is a census that, 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 uh, that takes a census of the fighting age, of the men of fighting age, if you will. And, uh, and, and it breaks it down, of course, uh, tribe by tribe and how many people, sometimes family by family, how many people are, are from each one of these tribes, how many people from, uh, from these families. And what we end up with is, is, uh, is a, rather, uh, a rather large uh, complement of people who would be able to fight in case the need arises. We're looking at something over 600,000 men. Of course, the Levites are excluded from this because the Levites are supposed to be uh, dedicated wholly to God. And, and, and so they are not included in this particular census. Later on, there will be a census taking of, taking of the Levites and the priests and things like this. But, but uh, what we see here in, in this particular section is just the, the men of fighting age now that brings us to a um, that brings us to a, a, a sort of staggering number of people. If we consider that there are over six hundred thousand fighting men, then how many people are we talking here? Because if that excludes even the Levites, um, 
we could be, you know, if, if the, it excludes the women and children, excludes uh, maybe even men who are over the fighting age, you know, uh, there's some debate about that. But nonetheless, we're looking at a number in the millions, a couple of million of people most likely coming out of Egypt and then going into the promised land. And of course, um, of course, uh, the, the naysayers and the, the skeptics will uh, be found everywhere saying, well, the numbers in the book of Numbers are exaggerated. You know, there couldn't possibly be <clears throat> two million people or so that come out of uh, out of the uh, out of this um, bondage in Egypt and into the wilderness. The wilderness would not support them. Of course, those same people are probably skeptical of the fact that God gave the people manna to eat, um, and and so they wouldn't have to be looking for food or scavenging for food. God gave them uh, in, on a number of um, times uh, or a number of instances. God delivers. Uh, birds to the, to the camp so that they can have meat to eat as well. God provides miraculously out of, uh, out of the rocks of the desert, provides water for them to drink. And so there would, would have been no need really to, uh, for, for them to, to have um, grown crops or foraged for food or water or things like that. God is the one who's providing miraculously for them. And, and some people tend to forget that that is the, that, you know, that's part of the whole message of the book. Of numbers and, and really, honestly, the book of uh, the, the Pentateuch in general is that God is providing for His people, and they say, "Well, yeah, but uh, you know, there's no real evidence of those people. You know, um, we don't see any artifacts that are left behind, like various implements that they would have used to survive and this sort of thing." But when we get a, when we get a little bit further on, when they when they transition and, and step over into the Promised Land, when they finally get there, we're going to see a little bit of we're going to see sort of an innocuous phrase that says, uh, that, that mentions just by way of passing, with that, that the whole time that the Israelites were in the desert, their clothes did not wear out and their shoes did not wear out. And so, uh, and so that is extended to the other artifacts that they would not have been able to make, you know, while they're wandering in, in, in the wilderness, um, then it would seem to it would stand to reason that God miraculous, miraculously pr provided for the, uh, for the, um, the continuation of those things for the uh, preservation of them. And in doing so, uh, certainly there wouldn't be any implements or artifacts left behind. Uh, that, that would be in keeping with what the Bible says about it. Um, so anyhow, uh, you know, the skeptics will, will continue to rage on and whatnot. But nonetheless, we're looking at about 2 million, probably about 2 million people or so, uh, who, are, who are gathered at Sinai, beginning of this book, and they're, they're hearing from God. They've done, uh, they've built everything. They've done everything that God commands them to. And they're getting ready to, to, uh, to leave from them. Uh, the camp is given uh, sort of an arrangement. And whether it's in marching, when they're marching, or when they are, when they're camped in, in solitary in one specific place, uh, the Book of Numbers records this, this arrangement. And basically the arrangement is that the, that the, the, the tabernacle, whether it's set up in, in service for, for worship or whether it's packed up and being carried by the, by the people who are carrying it, uh, the tabernacle is generally in the middle of the people. Um, and this is, uh, this is in keeping with you know, how, how various armies uh, would advance in those days. They would have a, a sort of a forward guard. Uh, and in the middle, you would have the king. And you would have the, you know, the nobles and, and things like that. And, and then you would have the rear guard following it. That way, if the camp is attacked at any point, uh, the, the, the things of value are in the middle. And, and uh, the, you know, the people will be able to form up ranks around it, you know, no matter what. Uh, another thing that's worth noting about the way that the camp is arranged is that the, the tent of meeting is in the middle, um, but, uh, but that the Levites are surrounding it. And whether it's camped or whether it's encamped or whether it's on the march, the Levites are surrounding it. And of course, uh, this is because the, the Levites have been chosen by God as the tribe that would be, that, that would be used and, and set aside to, uh, to minister by service to the, temp, the temple, the tabernacle at this point. Um, and, and they would provide service. So they would be the ones carrying mo uh, many of the parts there, right? The, the parts of the tabernacle. And they would be the ones... Uh, who uh, would be serving with the priests. And of course, the priests come from a specific family in the, in the Levites. 
<clears throat> so the, the priests, together with the Levites, were the ones who had charge over the temple, had charge over making sure everything was set up right, making sure that, um, that everything was transported correctly according to the way that God had commanded. And, uh, and so they were the ones that immediately were, were uh, dedicated, set aside to, to minister to the tabernacle. If something or someone who is not a Levite got close to this temple or this tabernacle, rather, um, God, God commands that they be put to death. And so they were there almost as a buffer zone to keep people who were not of the Levites um, and people who had not been commanded to, to do the ministry of, of the, uh, the tabernacle. They were there to keep a buffer zone so the people would know where to stop. They wouldn't go. Uh, toward the tabernacle and thus incur, incur guilt upon themselves. You remember that in the last book, we saw Nadab and Abihu took it upon themselves to uh, to do something that God had not commanded. And, uh, and God, uh, God uh, the, the fire that says broke out from before the Lord and consumed them. And, and, uh, and the people, the people rightfully so, were very concerned about doing things properly after that. Uh, so anyhow, um, that, that's what we see in Genesis 1 and 2. We get a census. We see the camp going on. Um, after that, uh, the, the, the book basically chronicles uh, the, 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 the priests and the Levites, all of their duties, what they're supposed to do in reference to uh, the ministry of the temple, and of course, sacrifices and whatnot. That's in Numbers 3 and 4. In Numbers uh, 5 and 6, we get some rules or laws that, that are concerned with lepers, with, well, with various uh, kinds of people, if you will what to do with lepers, you know, that they are to be outside the camp, that they, that the various things that are, uh, that are prescriptions for them, uh, what to do with, with thieves. If somebody steals something, that they are to pay restitution in addition to offering the proper sacrifices. Uh, adulteresses. Uh, in, in an interesting passage here in, in, um, in, in, in this section, we see that God gives, uh, gives some reference on what to do with adulteresses. Now, these are, these are uh, women who, uh, this is in chapter 5, starting in verse 11. I do want to make a couple comments on this because this passage is often misrepresented among the enemies of God. Um, and uh, basically what it's talking about is it, it, this is the notion of, uh, of a man who has a sort of spirit of jealousy. He believes his, his wife is uh, being unfaithful to him. And so... He, he can't prove it. He doesn't have the evidence. She hasn't been caught, you know, red-handed in the act. But he, he just really sincerely feels that there's something going on, uh, and she's being unfaithful. And so, so God gives this this test to to for the Israelites to do, so that uh, the the innocent wife can be exonerated, or the guilty wife can be punished. And it's kind of an interesting. It's kind of a weird a weird thing. So basically, what happens is that um, is that they're, they're they're to take some dust off the floor of the, the tabernacle and mix it together with some water. Uh, they are to have the woman who is uh, suspected of adultery to drink this water while, while performing some vows. Um, and, and then she also has to perform uh, a, a sacrifice. And if she, is, if she has been faithful, the Bible says that nothing will happen to her. No, nothing will happen to her whatsoever. She'll, she'll be fine and she can go on and, and the husband can relax and he can know in his heart that God has judged her to be innocent. But if she is not faithful, if she, if, if she has actually been secretly an adulteress, then she drinks of this water, she does this sacrifice, she takes this vow, she speaks this curse upon herself. And, um, and then if, if she has been unfaithful, the, the Bible says that her, her stomach will swell. Uh, with the water and with the bitter water and her thigh will fall away. In other words, there's some pretty significant uh, physical uh, reactions that will demonstrate the guilt of this woman. <clears throat> and, and so, um, and so that's, uh, that, that's what, the, that's what the, the, the passage is about. It's trying to determine whether or not a woman is, is, is uh, guilty of adultery. But what the enemies of God have done in recent days and recent years is that they have taken this passage and somehow sort of warped it, and I don't know what kind of exegesis they're, they're, they're using. It's not exegesis at all. But, uh, but what they're trying to do is to make it say that this passage teaches uh, that, that God is commanding a, um, a, a chemical abortion, that this is somehow, uh, the, the, this test for adultery is somehow a, a, a chemical abortion, which, of course, is nonsense. Uh, God does not sanction abortion anywhere in Scripture. In fact, 
uh, abortion as, as as it is practiced in our culture. Really, the word, the biblical word for abortion, uh, the, the, as it's practiced in our culture, would be child sacrifice, uh, because because moms and dads are sacrificing the life of their child so that they can achieve whatever amount of prosperity that they want, whether it's prosperity or or education or uh, safety or uh, you know whatever the case may be. They believe that sacrificing this child, the life of this child, will get them the life they want, and that's why. That, that's why people in, in, in the days of, of, uh, of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, that's why people of the, of the nations engaged in child sacrifice was because they believed that by sacrificing their child, they would appease the gods and the gods would give them a life of prosperity and protection, safety and security. That's exactly why people sacrifice their children today. Uh, they may not have a little altar. They may not have a little a little uh, statue or, or things like that, but that's exactly, the, nonetheless, that, that's exactly why they are doing those things today. So, so anyhow, um, this, uh, this portion of scripture does not, in fact, sanction abortion. Um, let's see, the, the next group of people that, that this section uh, addresses is that of the Nazarites. Those are taking a Nazarite vow. Uh, and the Nazarite vow was a special vow that a person would fulfill, uh, and they, there, there were some ceremonies that were associated with that as well. Um, some notable characters, characters, some notable people throughout the scripture who um, are seen either uh, are, are seen as having a Nazarite vow. Uh, obviously, Samson comes to mind uh, because Samson was commanded at the, at the very, but his parents were commanded really before he was born. That he would, he would, that the, the razor would never touch his head, which was a Nazarite, a thing for those who are under a Nazarite vow. The razor would not touch his head, uh, that he would not partake of any sort of fermented or alcoholic beverages, and that he would not defile himself by touching a dead body. And of course, when we get to judges, we'll see that, um, that he does all three of those things. Uh, anyway, uh, so those are, the, you know, that was Samson, uh, possibly John the Baptist. Uh, was a you know had had a, a Nazarite vow, and of course we see Paul um, when he when he uh, um, when he is in the temple uh, when he when he's arrested in the temple, it, it talks about him um, it talks about him shaving his head and, and, and this sort of thing as if he were um, completing a vow or completing a, a period of vow. So uh, see, Nazarite vows were not always lifelong. In fact, they most of the time weren't. A Nazarite vow was something that you vowed in particular, and then you would you would forego certain things until the vow was fulfilled, and then you would go and you know you could go and engage in those things. You could shave your head and and, and all that sort of thing. So anyway, the Nazarites. There's some some uh, things given for the Nazarites there. Uh, number to Numbers chapter seven. What we see there, we see that the the tabernacle is consecrated. And the very detailed information about how the, how the Israelites go about doing that, the sacrifices that were made um, the, in order to consecrate the, the temple. Uh, in, in chapter uh, chapter eight, uh, we have the Levites who are consecrated at that point. Um, and then uh, and then and then in chapter nine, what we see is that the Passover is celebrated. Uh, the Passover is celebrated, and uh, the. This is significant because this is a year after they have been delivered from the, the year after their first Passover. Um, and so the Passover is celebrated. And this is the high point, really, of the book of Numbers and really the high point of the narrative of the exit, the whole exit. So Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. This is the high point with the exception, the possible exception of when they're about ready to cross over and go into the promised land. Uh, but we see we see that the here are the Israelites. They have Receive the law of God. They, they they have consecrated the Levites. They have they have uh, they have uh, built everything that God has commanded them to, and now they're ready to go and and set off for the Promised Land. And they celebrate the Passover, um, and then uh, you know, and then um, they 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 depart. They they leave. We see this happening in in, uh, in chapter ten, and no sooner do they leave than in chapter eleven the problems begin. Uh, in chapter, in between chapter eleven and chapter twenty, we see, and really even even to the end of, of the book of Numbers, what we see is a constant pattern of God of God being faithful or picking up pick, picking Israel up, and Israel falling back into the same pattern of behavior. Really, 
the major thing that is, the, is problematic for Israel in, in this this whole section from here on out <clears throat> until they get to in, until they get to the end of the, the book of Numbers anyway. The thing that's problematic is their their attitude. <laughs> they complain and they complain and they complain and time after time and time again they begin to they begin to state things or say things like, "Well, I wish we were back in Egypt." You know, there was food back in Egypt. We had pots of meat sitting around that we could just we were we were you know we were living high on the hog back in Egypt. They wanted to go back into slavery rather than being free and trusting in their God to take care of them. How many times does that sound like us today? How many times do we would we rather have slavery with prosperity or slavery with affluence than freedom with God, even though it's sort of a dangerous freedom, if you will. Um, you know, this last year, this last year with, uh, with our, our struggle with COVID in, in our culture and things like this, uh, this last year has really driven that point home to me as I look around at my brothers and sisters. And, um, you know, there, there is warrant sometimes to be cautious. You don't want to uh, inordinately endanger your brothers and sisters in Christ. You want to show love to them, love for neighbor, love for brother, to, to make sure not to get them sick and this sort of thing. But the the abject the abject giving up of our our, our liberties and our rights. You know, I I, I understand that, that, that there are people who are walk, who are watching this uh, live stream uh, who are not in the United States. Uh, but in the U.S., um, you know, at least in our local context here, what we have seen is a trampling of our of our our constitution, which really was which was really based on originally, at least in part, uh, th this notion of liberty. You know, and that that liberty um, that liberty we justified it in those days, of course, and we applied it absolutely and perfectly um, because you know at the same time that we were we were talking about liberty for all. We were also uh, engaged in, in slave uh, the slave trade, but uh, but at least the ideal was there, and, and the ideal was that God has granted mankind, the human beings, to be free. This this uh, this freedom of conscience, this freedom of, uh, of the ability to, to make one's own decision. Well, we have uh, we have allowed a, a crisis to be manufactured in our nation, and in, in the doing of it, we have also handed over many of our rights to the various uh, governing authorities in our whether state, local, or, or national, um, people oftentimes prefer safety, the safety of slavery over the, over the danger of freedom. And um, that's exactly the Israelites' problem here. They were complaining about, uh, they were complaining about the lack of safety, the lack of being able to know where your next meal comes from. Uh, they, were, they were complaining uh, about God. <clears throat> well, um, basically, between chapters 11 and chapter 20, what we see is that, uh, is that, Israel, is that Israel, through a series of, of various things, the, the unfaithfulness of Israel will be highlighted. And yet, God is nonetheless faithful to discipline them, but to also restore them and, and uh, bring them back. All right. Um, well, in, in Numbers 11, uh, the people complain. Um, they complain about the the, uh, the lack of food. They complain about the, the, the water, the lack of water. They complain that the food that God has given them is not is not what they like. It's not really palatable for their, their stomach. It's not what they want. Uh, they want some meat, and so God sends them quail, and they catch these quail. And as a result, uh, I don't know if it was the bird flu or what, but as a result, uh, a plague enters the camp, and God uh, God judges them. Uh, and and uh, he does so, uh, but then after that, God uh, also appoints judges for the people, so that uh, so that they can be a little bit better. The administration can be a little bit better, a little bit tighter that way. Um, in Numbers twelve, we have Miriam and Aaron. Miriam and Aaron questioning Moses's right to lead. Uh, now, in, uh, in in Numbers chapter twelve, the the questioning. Of Moses's ability to lead really is revealed to be uh, to be related to the fact that Moses has a Cushite wife. Look at twelve one. It says Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, 
uh, for, for he had married a Cushite woman. So Moses gets married to a Cushite woman. Uh, for those of who may not know, uh, Cush was an area in Ethiopia, what was modern day Ethiopia. And so in all likelihood, um, this would have been a, a black woman uh, and, and Moses would have been a, a Semite, so he would have been a Jewish man. Uh, so this was an, uh, an interracial marriage, and it, 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 this is a blending of the ethnicities, uh, a blending of the peoples, if you will. Now, Moses' wife undoubtedly was a follower of Yahweh, and the reason that we can we, we can state that with almost absolute certainty is because later on, what we'll see is that God pro, God uh, prohibits intermarriage with these other nations around them, it prevents Israel from intermarrying with the nations around them. But it's not a, uh, he's not preventing them from doing so because of the different ethnicities. Now, he calls them by their ethnicities. But understand this, when God prohibits them from intermarrying with the peoples around them, the issue is not the, the ethnicity, the genetic differences. The issue is that, is that these people and these nations serve different gods. And the problem is, is that when, when Israel goes to intermarry with these peoples who are, who are uh, outside of the covenant, who are not worshipers of Yahweh, they're going to lead Israel astray. Uh, and God makes that unequivocal. It's not the, it's not the ethnic issue. It's the religious issue that, that is at stake here. And, um, and God, God uh, doesn't, allow for, doesn't allow for intermarriage of, of people uh, who are not of the people of God. And this is something, by the way, that God does not change when it comes to the New Testament. This is something that God uh, keeps in effect. Uh, that we are to we are not to be unequally yoked with non-believers. Now there are, excuse me, there are um, some rules about that, some laws about that. Of course, when we when we get into uh, the New Testament, we get into First Corinthians seven, for example. Uh, the Bible tells us that uh, that God um, God is allowed the, the only instance in which God allows for a an interfaith marriage, if you will, is if um, Two people who are already married, uh, and then all of a sudden it's, it's discovered that one of them, uh, well, either one of them gets saved and the other one is not, or maybe they got married and it was it was uh, it was assumed that they both were saved. Um, but then we find out later on that the fruit of the spirit is not with one of them, and, they, they, and, it's, and it's sort of evident that they are not saved. Um, then God says that the, that the spouses are to remain married so so long as the unbelieving spouse is willing to stay with the believing spouse. Uh, the, 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 such an arrangement, in other words, um, just because they are of different, uh, just because they're unequally yoked, it's discovered they're unequally yoked, that's not, that's not in itself a cause for divorce. Uh, now, um, and in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul talks about the sanctifying effect that the believing spouse will have on the unbelieving spouse and on the, on the children of the, of the marriage as well. Uh, so, but you know that's for another day. But uh, but that particular thing is 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 consistent throughout Scripture. Is all I wanted to show. The Scripture nowhere nowhere in the Scripture do we have a section that tells us that we are not to marry uh, that we cannot we are prohibited from marrying people who are not say for example the same skin color as we are. So we can we can marry um, who, we, we can marry people as long as, as long as it's a human being of the opposite gender. We can marry whoever we want. We are free to marry in the Lord, the Bible says. So uh, uh, obviously this, uh, this wife, this Cushite wife that Moses had married, was a, uh, was a follower of Yahweh. She was what they would have called a, a God-fearing Gentile or a proselyte. A proselyte. Um, but she, uh, she, was, she was fine for, for Moses to marry. So Moses, Moses marries her. Well, Aaron and Miriam get bent out of shape. And they use this as a foothold by which they can then um, uh, challenge Moses' authority to lead. Well, God calls Miriam and Aaron into the tent, and, and God gives Miriam leprosy uh, as, a, as, a, as a way of showing, hey, look, don't mess with my servant. Don't mess with the one, uh, you know, with the, with the anointed of God, the, the one that God has chosen. So Miriam gets leprosy. Uh, Moses prays for her, intercedes on her behalf. God grants that she's healed, but she does have to stay outside the camp for, I think, seven days um, and uh, before she's allowed to come back into the camp. In doing so, God demonstrates that he, is, uh, that he is, has chosen Moses to be his leader. 
Now, in, in chapter 13, uh, chapter 13 and 14, we come to a critical juncture in the book of Numbers. Uh, for, the, for the Hebrew people have, have come to the, the wilderness in Kadesh Barnea. And from Kadesh Barnea, that's kind of the last stop before they get into the land of Canaan and they begin their conquest of the promised land. That at least that's what they're supposed to do. Well, they are, they are at Kadesh Barnea, and uh, um, Moses sends in 12 spies into the land. He wants to spy out the land. He wants to see if it's a good land. He wants to see, okay, where are the cities? Where are the strongholds? Where are the places that we want to focus on first and this kind of thing? It's always a good stra strategic thing to do. And so he, so he does this. He sends 12 spies out into the land. And they, kind of, they, they go in there and they, they spy out the land. They, they look at it. And indeed, they see that the land is a beautiful land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. And that it's a land where, uh, where um, they would, if they were to inhabit it, they would prosper. Uh, and quite frankly, it's a land that is much better than the land they're in now, right? They're in the wilderness at that point. And they are enduring harsh conditions. And they're having to depend upon God for manna and water from rocks and all this sort of thing. And they see that in the land, they could be growing grape clusters that are like six feet long, you know, or five feet long. I don't know how tall they were back then. It says that two men would hold a single cluster on a, on a, uh, a pole that is, that, uh, that, you know, is strewn between them. And, uh, and so it's just a, it's a tremendous land. And, and, but there's, there's a bit of a problem with this land. This land is a good land. But this land also has some pretty significant defenders, right? This land is, is populated by a strong people, by, by giants, if you will. And so uh, they, they say the sons of Na uh, Anak are there, the, the Nephilim are there. And, uh, and, and that's, uh, that's the report that the spies bring back. And, uh, you know, when, when the people see the, the fruit that they, are, that they, that they have, when the people see, they hear the report that the, 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 the spies bring back, they're sort of cut to the quick, right? It's like having the prize in your hands and then having it snatched out all of a sudden. Now, um, we, should, uh, we should pause for just a minute and, and think about this. God promised them the promised land. What God did not do was promised them that the conquest of the promised land would be easy or that it would require no faith. And this is a this is sort of a, a lesson that we can take out of this, right? Because how many times is it that we we get ourselves believing on God for something to happen? And you know what? Maybe God did say that he wants that thing to happen. We won't even argue that at this point. But then but then when things get tough. Um, we get bent out of shape. You know, I used to be on the executive board for um, the church planting team in our state convention. And we would have, part of our responsibility was occasionally interacting with church planters. Obviously, we were, we were trying to qualify church planters, provide them with the means that they need in order to start their churches, uh, develop policy around training them, around uh, what kind of accountability they're held to and all this sort of thing. Uh, but we also we also just got to talk with them, you know, and I, that was the part of the job I loved the best because I'd love to hear about what God was doing in these various church plants that we were sponsoring and whatnot. Um, but you know, so it, the, the way we had things set up back then, it's a little different now. But the way we had things set up back then is we had we had a, a process by which we would help a church plant out over the course of about three years, and, and during that three years. The, the hope was that they would have the, enough time, enough, um, enough, uh, you know, God would, God, at least God's uh, intention would be, you know, known during that time, whether he was going to bless that church or whether he was going to uh, maybe move it or alter it or, or something like that. So um, anyway, uh, over the course of this three-year period, um, you know, a lot of church planters didn't even make it past like year two. A lot of them didn't. Now the, you know, and um, you, you start to hear about their stories and what the, what the problems were and everything and um, how they were burning themselves out and, and all this sort of thing. You learn quite a bit through this as well. Um, but uh, 
as you're, you know, as you're sitting there and you're talking to these young men, and um, you, you you see sort of this, sort of in some of them anyway. Now, many of them were very faithful. Many of them were very uh, willing to endure the hardship and to uh, and to go through those things. But but uh, more than on more than one occasion, I ran into a young man who would be like, I just didn't know it was going to be this hard. You know, I, I, I'm having to be bi- bivocational, you know, because the church isn't big enough to support me. And so I'm having to work a job over here, then do ministry over here. And I'm putting in 60 and 70 hours a week and I'm ignoring my family and, and all this sort of thing. And, and it's like, okay, hold on, brother, just settle down. Let's see if we can manage this, you know. Uh, but, uh, but on more than one occasion, they were fraught with the challenges that the planning a church, you know, presented. Um, you know, God may have given them a vision to plant a church, may have given open doors for them, may have got them started down that road. But when they found out that it was difficult, they began to they began to sort of doubt. They began to kind of fall away. And you know, that's not just for church planters. I've seen that in pastors. I've seen that in other ministry leaders uh, throughout my time as a pastor. Um, you know, burnout is a real thing. And there are some things I think that people do that don't help. Uh, for one, they ignore their own relationship with God. For two, they ignore uh, their, their, their duties and responsibilities to their families. And they wonder why things get burnt out so quickly or why things get so you know, crazy so quickly. Um, well, it's because God did not design you to do those things. He did not mean for you to, for example, ignore your family so that you can be involved in ministry. Um, in fact, a, a, a man who ignores his family so that he can do the ministry of God um, has disqualified himself from ministry because, because some of the requirements for ministry is that he, he governed his family well. Anyway, I'm, I'm kind of getting off into a rabbit trail there, but uh, but the, you know that is a significant truth that, that ministers, and I'm sure that many people watching this video are are those who God has raised up in the church to do ministry, whether as in a pastorate or an associate pastor or an elder or a teacher of some kind. Um, you know, God calls you first to your family. If you do not manage your family well, then you are to step down. And you are to you are to uh, reprioritize, but anyway, uh, the God had called the Israelites to take the Promised Land. They had not even begun to do that yet. They were just looking at all the work that had to be done, and they were fretting about it. We look like grasshoppers in their eyes. There's no way that we could go, we, we we could go in there and overtake the people there. They're too strong for us. Hold up a second. They're too strong for you? Do you realize that God has just delivered you out of the hands of the superpower of the day in Egypt? And he has delivered you free and clear, and he even got you. He, 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 you came out of there with the spoils of war. And you're afraid of Canaanites? Please. But that's what was happening. The people got their eyes off of God. They got their eyes off of what God could do. And they began to think about what was going to be required of them to accomplish this. Now, it would not be easy. As we'll see in a couple of weeks, the conquest of the promised land was not an easy thing to accomplish. Nonetheless, uh, the people are called, uh, the the people are called simply to be faithful and to walk in faith. And in Kadesh Barnea, they have a business meeting, if you will. I, I, I joke about this because uh, we're Baptists uh, at Aletheia Church here. And, you know, Baptists are known for potlucks and business meetings. So, in particular, we're Southern Baptists. So, they're really known for business meetings, right? We go out of our way to multiply meetings. Um, you know, I got involved with, with a ministry group one time uh, known as Operation Save America. And uh, those brothers, man, they do ministry and they might, you know, meet for a little bit of business here and there. I remember uh, we were in Arkansas one time, and um, uh, we sat down in the motel breakfast room to have our business meeting, which consisted of about a 45-minute strategy meeting where everybody, uh, 300, 400 people were going to go that day. And I just had to laugh at at, uh, Rusty, who's the the director, and he's like, what are you laughing about? I said, you know, I'm a Southern Baptist, and we Baptists, we, we have 
10 hours of meetings for 45 minutes worth of ministry. You all have 45 minutes of ministry or meetings for, for 10 hours of ministry. I kind of like things better that way, you know. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, uh, these guys, they, the 12 spies come back, they give the report, and they have a business meeting, and they have a vote, right? So, you know, um, uh, there, there are people who, uh, who say, well, there's no such thing as a congregational form of government in the, uh, in the, in the Bible. And I, 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 have to, I have to disagree. Here's a congregational form of government in the Bible. They come back, they vote. The vote is 10 to 2. Ten people vote that we don't do what God says and go into, and take the promised land. Two people vote in favor of it. The nays have it. And so all of Israel, two million plus people, are sitting at Kadesh Barnea whining about how, how the, the people of the land are going to overthrow them and overtake them. And, uh, and, and uh, they cut themselves off from the blessing of their generation. So they, they refuse God. They, they say, no, we're not going to go and invade the promised land. We're not going to trust that God will deliver us. We're not going to trust that God will overcome this, this trial. We're going to we're going to we're going to take it upon ourselves to uh, to determine that it's impossible. Um, and they disobey God. They decide they decide no. We're not going to we're not going to go into Canaan. Uh, I you know I, I jest about it being a business meeting um, because it, primarily because you know business meetings are formulated. Um, you, you don't actually see congregational type business meetings um, in the New Testament, right? You know, you, you see the elders um, of the church and the leaders of the church getting together to make policy and decide. You do see them asking the church membership to do things. For example, you know, when in Acts chapter 6, when the, the apostles say, look, it's not good for us to stop preaching the word, teaching the word to, to wait on tables. And so you choose for yourself seven men who we will appoint as uh, you know, as those who will, who will distribute the food. So uh, you see in Acts chapter six that there is an element in which the people, uh, the congregation, if you will, has to play in there in, in choosing the men. Uh, but ultimately, they are appointed nonetheless by uh, by the by the elders of the church. Excuse me. Um, they are appointed by the elders of the church, and and uh, and th that's where the authority resides. Um, and this is probably a good example of why the Bible doesn't have that kind of thing. Because, I mean, what are the, you know, the, the, the whole idea of an elder-led congregation or one that is led by elders, spiritually mature and qualified men, are giving leadership to the church. Now, if everybody gets to vote, what do we have? Well, we, I mean, the, the scripture tells us that in the earthly expression of the kingdom of God, in the church, there will be wheat and there will be tares. There will be those who are born again and those who are false converts and those who are wolves in sheep's clothing. And so, um, and so why would we open up a, dis a decision to be made to people who, uh, to a body of people who inevitably, some of them are, I mean, the scripture guarantees it, not born again. Why should they be having a say in what God's church does? So, uh, so you know, the, the, this, this notion of congregational Congregationally governed um, uh, uh, churches is is not is not really found anywhere in Scripture. Um, so anyway, I suppose that's a debate for another day. If you want to debate that in the comments, go right ahead. We'll 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 take that up a little bit more in depth. But what we see here is that uh, is that the, the people of God decide to disobey God, to not follow His instructions, to go and in, in, to take the promised land. As a result, God issues judgment upon them. God issues judgment upon them, um, and he, he's, he wants to destroy them again. This seems to be a common theme in Israel's, in Israel's history of this generation. Uh, and later on in the Psalms, you'll, you'll hear, like, for example, in Psalm 78, uh, you'll hear about, uh, you'll hear, you know, the, the psalmist talking about this generation who Basically, did everything they could to sort of kick against the goads that God was that, that God was uh, using on them. Um, but God's anger burns against uh, Israel. He's going to destroy them. Um, Moses uh, Moses intercedes again on behalf of Israel. God tells Moses, "Look, I will kill all of these people, and I will make a great nation out of you." 
And so my promise will not be void. I'll, I'll still keep my promise. It's just that they'll come from you rather than all of these people. Uh, Moses intercedes. And I want us to take a look at this passage here. This is in, in, uh, in chapter 14. I want us to take a look at chapter 14. Um, excuse me. Apparently, I need a backlight because my eyes are not working today. But in Numbers chapter 14, let's get to the right book. How about that? Now let's try it. In Numbers chapter 14, the Bible says this. But Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear of it. In other words, if he destroys the people. Then the Egyptians will, will hear of it, for you brought up this people in your might from among them. And they will tell the, the, the inhabitants of this land, they have heard of, they have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people. But you, O Lord, are seen face to face, and your, your cloud stands over them. And you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day, in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill this people as one man, then the nations who have heard of your fame will say, it is because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land that he swore to give them and that he, has, that he has killed them in the wilderness. And now please let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised, saying the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the, the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. So that's Moses' prayer of intercession. And I want us to see a couple of things about Moses' prayer of intercession. Uh, first, Moses appeals to God. Uh, he doesn't say, oh, Lord, don't you love us? Don't you, you know, think of all the people that this, was, this would kill. Think of all the babies and think of the women. And think of all the children that are going to die. He doesn't use those sorts of approach, that sort of approach to pull the heartstrings of God. He appeals to God not on the basis of what this is going to do to the people. God knows very well what this is going to do to the people. But he appeals to God on the basis of his concern for the glory of God. And he says, God, look, here's what, you know, if, if you do this, if you kill this people as one nation, then all the peoples of the nations that inhabits this land are going to laugh at you. And they're going to say that you were not strong enough to bring these people into the land. And so instead of doing that, you just decided to kill them in the wilderness. Think about what that, that's going to do to your great name, Lord, the, the reproach that that is going to bring. It would be untrue, of course. The people here, uh, they deserve to die in the wilderness. They deserve to, the, to, to not enter the land. But Lord... Lord, why, why should your name suffer reproach for the sake of vengeance here? Um, he appeals to the Lord on the basis of the glory of God. He appeals to the Lord on the basis of, uh, of the, the, the nations knowing his character. The second part, though, he appeals to God on the basis of is God's divine justice and God's divine mercy. And he, he appeals to him, please, to forgive the iniquity of your children. You know, he appeals to God on the basis of God's character. God is loving. God is just. God is holy. God is merciful. And, and, and uh, Moses appeals to him. He says, Lord, we know that you will judge the guilty. We know that you will not forgive them. We know that that's going to be the case. But even so, Lord, be merciful in forgiving the iniquity of the people. Moses appeals to God on the basis of his character. Moses appeals to God on the basis of his promise. Moses appeals to God on the basis of the glory of God among the nations. How does that, how, how vastly does that differ from our approach many times in prayer to God? We pray to God many times that he would alleviate people's suffering so that the people who are suffering don't have to suffer. And I think a lot of times we do that because we don't like to suffer. And so we feel sort of guilty that we're not actually going through it. And so we, we issue a prayer for God to alleviate their suffering so that we don't have to feel guilty 
that we aren't suffering. I think a lot of times our prayers in that way are self-centered. Rather, we should pray, Lord, relieve their suffering according to your great mercy. But if you should have them suffer, Lord, have them suffer well, so that they can display your glory in the midst of their suffering. You see, because what happens to us in this, in this, in this life, what happens to us is a, a momentary pain and affliction compared to the weight of glory that we will receive when we stand before him. Yes, our prayer, we should pray for people's suffering to be relieved. We should also pray that ultimately their suffering would be used to the glory of God. We should pray with a concern that the character and the nature of God should be displayed in our suffering. That, that, uh, that, that his goodness and his mercy and, and his ability to help us persevere should be on display during that time. Um, you know, Moses' prayer is intercession for others. He confesses their sin. He says, Lord, I don't have any excuse. They're sinners. They are have been rebelling against you. They and, and yet, yet, uh, Lord, please forgive me. And it's interesting uh, what, what we're going to see this sort of play out. Not to try to give any spoilers. Of course, you've already read the book. But as this plays out, because Moses prays for the people, and because God grants his request and does not slay them where they deserve to be slain, it, God does not raise up a a people from the line of Moses for himself, right? He doesn't, he doesn't make Moses great. Moses is like, look, I don't want that. I don't want that. He doesn't do that. But nonetheless, it, it, but the people are allowed to survive and they're allowed to continue. And they continue to complain. <laughs> the, book of, the book of Numbers continues on and they're, they're complaining during the whole 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And as a result, Moses one day gets fed up with them and he loses his temper. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. And because Moses prays that these people be allowed to live and that God forgive them, God doesn't make that, that great people out of Moses. God let, allows this, this, this uh, grumbling generation to continue on until the point where they, 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 incite, they incite rage within Moses. He loses his temper and he strikes the rock. And because he does that, God doesn't allow Moses to enter the promised land. I got to wonder. If God would have killed everybody and would have accomplished his promise through Moses alone, wouldn't would Moses have been able to enter the promised land? I don't know. You know, Moses' intercession for the people might very well have cost him his ability to enter the promised land. But that's okay. That's what he was called to do, and he faithfully discharges, at least at this point, his ministry that God has called him to. He intercedes on behalf of the people. Um, God does grant to not destroy the people. God says, okay, I won't destroy the people, but here's what's going to happen. Not a single one of these people who made this decision to, to, to stay out of the promised land, when I told them to go in, not a single one of these people are going to enter the promised land. They're all going to die in the desert. They're going to die in the wilderness, and we're going to walk around the wilderness for as long as it takes for these people to die. And that, that's going to be 40 years, by the way. So 40 years. It's going to take them 40 years. One year for every day that the spies were in the land. The spies had gone to the land for 40 days. They had spied out the land. They had come back and decided not to go into the land. So God says, okay, you won't. None of you will. Not a single one of you, with the exception of two people. Those people are Caleb and, and uh, Caleb and Joshua. Why Caleb and Joshua? Well, Caleb and Joshua are two of the twelve spies. Two of the twelve spies, and they um, they went into the land and they were the ones that came back and said, "Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff there. Yeah, there's giants there, but hey, we got God. Those giants ain't going to be nothing to us. So let's go take the land." They were the two voices of dissent among the spies that came back. They were the minority report. <laughs> Not really. They were the majority report. They were the ones who had, that the were going to be faithful with the plan of God. Uh, and so God will allow them to enter the promised land, but they, even they, have to walk with this, 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 uh, these people for the next 40 years. 
because of because of people's refusal to go to the promised land. Well, Israel immediately regrets their decision to ignore God at the at Kadesh Barnea, and they decide they're going to take matters upon themselves to go into the land and start fighting to try to invade the land. And so they do. So they, they rise up, they get up and say, no, God is with us. We're going to the land. Of course, this is what? This is ignoring what Moses has said. And Moses, again, this is where, where they challenge his authority, and they challenge the, 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 the reality that he is the, he is the one that God has appointed to deliver the message. They, they, and, and they take it upon themselves to usurp that authority and go into the land. And what happens? Well, what happens is that many of them die, and they get defeated, and they get routed, and they come crying with their tail between their legs back to the people. Too many more people die. Um, we see this common refrain of the people of Israel doubting God, and it usually takes the place of, or takes the takes the uh, it manifests itself as them rebelling against the authority that God has put over them, which should tell us something about God appointed authority. That if there is a God appointed authority, whether it be in the home whether it be in the, uh, in, in the church, whether it be in the government, that as long as that God-appointed authority is, is telling us the truth about what God has said and about what God requires, that we need to come under submission. We need to come under submission to that authority and place ourselves into submission under that authority now, so long as it is, it is, it is, as it is a godly authority. So, anyway, um, the, uh, the, uh, they go out, they attack the Amalekites, uh, and, and they are destroyed. The Amalekites spank them, uh, and they are chased back to the camp. Uh, now, Numbers 15 talks a little bit more about sacrifices in the Sabbath. Um, a couple of things that happen, uh, 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 or, well, one thing that happens, interestingly enough, in this passage, is that there is a case where a young man is caught, picking up sticks on the Sabbath. And uh, the people don't know what to do with him, so they, they hold him until he can go before the judge. When he goes before the judge, Moses inquires of the Lord, and God says, kill him. Kill him. And we're like, what? All he did was pick up a few sticks on Saturday. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, is he was, he was disobeying God's law. In God's law, require in, in the you know, rebellion against God's law is sin. How many times do we have to say it? When, when God speaks, humans are to obey. And God had spoken in this particular instance. This young man had rebelled against God, and God, God put him to death. Uh, but this is an interesting passage because it, it represents the first time, really, that the people uh, are called upon to put this young man to death. It represents the, the, the first time that we see that we see that happening. I mean, prior to this, you know, God is the one who is um, exercising judgment. God is the one who, you know, Miriam rebels against God's authority. God gives her leprosy. You know, um, uh, you know, the others rebel against God's authority. God, you know, by, by building this calf, this golden calf, and worshiping it, God kills them. Um, and, and they do the, the Levites do are used as a nation to sort of exercise judgment. But here what we have is the, is the judgment of an individual who has broken the law and is is taken before the judges and who uh, you know as, as the people have, have been assembled and um, it is executed. It's the first case of really government in, in gay, you know capital punishment in in Israel. Anyway, Immediately after this, though, in chapter 16, we, we, uh, we, 16 and 17, actually, we have a full-on rebellion against Moses. Now, the people don't like the way things are going. They are not happy with their lot uh, and being stuck in the desert for the next 40 years. They don't want to eat manna for the next 40 years or whatever the case may be, and they challenge Moses' authority again. And this challenge comes from, uh, in, it's, it's known as Korah's Rebellion. Um, it comes from uh, among the Levites, among other people as well. Uh, but but three 
uh, three families get together, and those who follow them, some of whom are Levites, uh, they get together and they rebel against against Moses. And they say, look, you're not the one that's the, who, who put you in charge over all of us. We're not going to do what you say. And so the Lord tells Moses to summon them to, uh, to a, a meeting in the tent. And they're like, we're not coming out to, to you. Who are you, right? Uh, who are you? Well, God's like, okay, okay, fine. Uh, tell them this. And Moses tells them, he says, look, uh, separate yourself from Korah and from his followers. And, uh, and watch what God does to them. Watch if, if, if they're allowed to continue on and live and nothing happens to them, then God has not appointed me as leader. This is Moses, right? But if the earth swallows them up, opens up and swallows them up so that they go alive down into Sheol, then you will know that I've been appointed the leader. Well, as soon as he says this, what happens? Well, the earth opens up, swallows them up alive into Sheol. The fire, the fire from the censers of two hundred was it two hundred and fifty people who had been uh, uh, who were, or of Korah's family or of his entourage, people who were allied with him. They had they had taken. <coughs> excuse me, two hundred and fifty of them had taken fire in their censers, and uh, and God breaks out with fire and, and consumes them as well. <coughs> excuse me. And so God unequivocally states or affirms the Moses and Aaron's leadership. Um, so uh, these, these co-conspirators are either swallowed by the land or consumed by the fire. And then God turns around and says, okay, enough is enough. And he begins to inflict upon the people, uh, inflict a plague upon the people. Basically, this is God adding an exclamation point to the, to the fact that Moses is his leader. And what Moses, the, the person who's going to be in charge of the people, and uh, the authority of Moses is to, to not be challenged or not be questioned. God inflicts a plague upon them. Moses and Aaron intercede on behalf of the people. Uh, again, we have God destroying the people or setting out to destroy them. Moses and Aaron intercede on their behalf. Um, God, God demonstrates that he has chosen Aaron by uh, by by. Uh, Later on, he says, look, I want all of you, all of you elders to bring a staff before me. Write your name on them. And they all come and they all bring a staff. And then Aaron, he causes Aaron's staff to bud with flowers. And now, of course, if um, in order for any tree to bud, it's got to have roots to get nutrients from the ground and get water from the ground. But God unequivocally demonstrates that, that Moses and Aaron are the ones that he is, he is called to lead, both by destroying those who rebel against them and by positively affirming it by making Aaron's staff bud. It has flower buds that come up on it. In doing so, um, he says, look, stop rebelling against them. <laughs> stop rebelling against them. Well, things sort of calm down from there. Um, and, uh, and, and so... You know, later on in chapter uh, chapter eighteen and nineteen, we have laws that are, are given uh, for for um, the Levites, their purification and, and things like that. Uh, chapter twenty, we get the we get the the the, the uh, death of Miriam, and uh, and uh, in in chapter twenty also we come to a, a rather saddening part of the book of Numbers. Uh, in chapter 20, verse, starting in verse 10, we see that, uh, again, they're, they're in the wilderness. And, of course, the wilderness is hard, and it's a harsh environment, and they're thirsty. They're dying of thirst, or at least that's what they're saying. And uh, <coughs> let's see, let's see, verse, uh, let's see, verse, verse 7. This says, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother." And tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So, so he, God tells Moses, hey, look, just speak to the rock. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, earlier on in their travels, they had come to the rock, and, and Moses had been commanded to strike the rock, then the rock would pour forth water. Now Moses is being commanded to speak to the rock, or just to talk to the rock and tell it to yield its water. 
And uh, he says, so you shall bring water out of the rock for them <clears throat> and give them uh, to the congregation, uh, give them to drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded them. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Here now, you rebels, <clears throat> shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Now notice what he says. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Shall Aaron and I bring water out of this rock for you? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck, it, struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. So Moses doesn't actually do what the Lord tells him to do here, does he? He was told to speak to the rock, to tell the rock, bring forth water. And the rock was supposed to bring forth water at that point. But what does he do? He gets mad. <clears throat> he loses his temper. He's tired of these people complaining. And he goes up, at least that's my understanding of it. He goes up and he strikes the rock. Well, nothing happens the first time he strikes the rock. So he strikes it again. He hits it twice. And God brings forth water. Um, God in his mercy brings forth water. Because Moses didn't do what God told him to do. Let's continue. And furthermore, Moses, when he goes before the people, look at what he says and the significance of what he says. He's standing there with Aaron, his brother. And he says, shall we, in other words, Moses, Aaron and I, Shall we bring forth water from this rock? So he kind of takes credit for this miracle of God for himself. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. <clears throat> These are the waters of Meribah where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through, uh, and through them he showed himself holy. Moses and Aaron did not do what God tell, told them to do. And notice what it says, how God describes that. He describes their crime as not believing in me and refusing to make me holy. <clears throat> you didn't believe in me, and you refuse to make me hold holy in, in front of the people. That's what disobedience can be really boiled down to. Lack of faith in God, not believing in him. Not in the sense that Moses disbelieved the existence of God. Clearly Moses believed in the existence of God. But in the sense that, that Moses did not trust God. But he did not trust God. He did not believe in me, and uh, he did not uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people. So that's uh, that's what happens with Moses. <clears throat> God says, I'm not going to let you go into my promised land. I'm not going to let Aaron go to my promised land. In the next chapter, uh, in the next chapter, Aaron, God fulfills this, um, fulfills this promise to Aaron, and that Aaron dies. Or I'm sorry, it's... <clears throat> It's not even the next chapter. It's in the next section. Uh, Aaron dies before we get out of chapter 20. <clears throat> and he tells Moses and Aaron both that you shall not enter into my land. You shall not enter into the promised land. Well, um, in, in Numbers 22 through 25, we also have a, another interesting Another interesting passage. This concerns a, a guy by the name of Balaam, <clears throat> and Balaam uh, is, a, is an interesting figure that is brought up or alluded to later on, in various places later on in Scripture. Balaam is a he's a prophet, but he, apparently he's a prophet for profit. He's a prophet in that God gives him uh, knowledge and God allows him to proclaim His word. He, God speaks to him, and he, he speaks to other people. <clears throat> well, he's well known by Balak, who is the king of Midian. Excuse me. Excuse me. And, and so Balaam, um, Balaam is just sitting at home one day. Balak, Balak, the king of Midian, looks out, and he sees 
I'm sorry, the king of Moab. He's the king of Moab. He sees the uh, he sees the Israelite people encamped on his borders, and he's like, man, there's no way we'll be able to fight those people. I mean, there's a couple million of them. You got to figure they're numerous. They're they're covering the, the plain, and so um, and so uh, so he goes and he, he's he, he's got to figure out a way to deal with these people. And he says, I know what I'll do. I'll go get Balaam, who's this prophet that I know about, and I'll get him to uh, to curse the people of Israel. And when he curses the people of Israel, then uh, then they will they'll not be able to go up and fight against him. So that's what he that's what he tries to do in a nutshell. Balaam, the king of Moab, he's fearful of the people, and he calls Balaam to uh, to come in and curse the people. Well, Balaam. He, he, he eventually, through of course, there's a, there's a whole series of back and forth. He doesn't. He, he refuses to go, and refuses to go. And finally, God allows him to go. So he hops on his donkey and he, he's headed out there to to Balak. And the angel of the Lord is standing in the way, so as to slay him. And Balaam's donkey, like like like, runs up against the wall of the cliff and, and hurts Balaam. And Balaam starts beating the donkey, and the donkey's like, "Hey, look." Stop beating me, you know. And you know, Balaam's freaking out because he's, you know, he he hears the donkey talk, he sees the angel, and finally he gets the message. And he's not supposed to say anything except what God gives him to say. So he goes to Balaam and he or Balaam, and he tells Balaam this. He says, Look, Balaam, here's the problem. Yeah, I'm a prophet of God. Yes, I could curse these people, but the problem is, is that I can't curse anything, anyone who God has not already cursed. And God hasn't cursed these people. God has blessed them. So I can't curse what God has blessed. See how this works? Uh, Balak refuses to take no for an answer. And so he brings Balaam to go and curse the people. Well, Balaam goes to curse the people. He opens his mouth, and all of a sudden, blessing starts coming out. He starts blessing the people. And Balak about loses his mind. What are you doing? He says, well, I told you. I couldn't say anything but what God wants me to say. Wouldn't that be great if all preachers were like that? <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if they, when they open up their mouth to spew some heresy, you know, like, you know, God, or Jesus broke the loss because, because of love or some other heresy like that. Um, wouldn't it be great if, if God would just, like, not allow heresy to come out of their mouth? It, like, they could speak nothing but, but blessing or nothing but truth. Um, you know, as a pastor, man, I wish, you know, that would make sermon prep a lot easier, <laughs> you know. Yeah, there's me being lazy. Um, anyway, I digress. Uh, so Balaam, uh, Balak takes Balaam to another place and says, okay, now try to curse them. And Balaam opens up his mouth to curse, and he starts blessing again. And so Balak, Balak does it a third time, and again, he blesses Israel. And so so uh, Balaam's like, look, I can't curse these people. I cannot speak a word of curse toward them. They are blessed by God, and there's nothing you or I or anybody else can do about that, except maybe there's something. Now, the text doesn't really go into what Balaam does here, but elsewhere in Scripture, such as in uh, the book of Revelation, <clears throat> we see in, in other places, we see what Balaam actually does here. You see, while Balaam cannot directly curse Israel, he gives a little bit of counsel to Balaam. And the counsel is this, basically, hey, look here, if you, if you, want to really, if you really want to hurt Israel, what do you do? First thing you've got to understand is that they have a covenant relationship with God. And you all remember back in the closing chapters of Exodus, of the book of Exodus, right? In the closing chapters of the book of Exodus, we had, we had uh, God telling Israel, look, if you obey the covenant, I will bless you. But if you disobey the covenant, then you will have curses. Well, uh, he says, Balaam apparently tells Balak, look, Here's what you need to do. You need to take some of those good-looking Moabite women, and you need to send them down there among the Israelites so that they can start, you know, fraternizing with the Israelites. If they begin to fraternize with the Israelites, those Israelites will break the law of their God, and they will bring curses upon themselves because of a violation of the covenant. So that's all. I'll see you later. So Balaam goes on. He goes back to where he was living. Balak does this, and he sends a, a, a number of the women down into uh, <clears throat> down into the camp of Israel, and it's, it works. It's successful. They begin to they begin to uh, commit adultery with the men of Israel, 
And they begin to worship their own gods among the people of Israel. And in doing so, Israel calls down the wrath of God upon themselves. And, uh, and, and uh, they begin to, uh, and God curses them. That's a way that God, God's curse is brought on, on, uh, on Israel. You know, in Revelation, uh, Revelation chapter 2, uh, God talks about those who hold to the teaching of Balaam. And that is the teaching of Balaam. It's to get the people of God to compromise so that they bring judgment upon themselves. Because the people of God are a blessed people. And uh, it, it, when, when, they, when, they are, when they compromise, when they compromise and they begin to uh, engage in idolatry, in syncretism, uh, they begin to compromise on the, on the, on the moral st and the, <clears throat> the practical stand that God has called them to, to, to take. They begin to be involved in sin. They're going to bring discipline on their, on their lives. That's true Old Testament and new. God will discipline the sons that he loves. Um, and and so, uh, so God brings judgment upon them. Um, there, is a, there is a disease that breaks out. Uh, there, there is also, uh, so there's a disease, the disease that breaks out. And also, uh, the sons of Aaron, uh, in order to bring a, a, an end to this curse, uh, again, have to kill those who are involved in, in, uh, in breaking the law of God. And so while, while, they're, they're, while they're engaged in the act, uh, he comes up and just runs a spear through both of them, thereby breaking the curse. <clears throat> and uh, Israel uh, has, to, has to throw that off, has to repent, has to uh, put that out. Put that out. Um, and then the plague is also a judgment from God. 24,000 people die in, in the plague. Well, I'm going to skip on forward. Uh, Quite a ways here to the end, uh, closer to the end, <clears throat> chapter thirty-five, because there, because uh, there's uh, there are a number of things that take that take place. Um, there's a number of laws that that are that are uh, laid down. Uh, one of the most interesting ones is is Zalapahed's daughters. Uh, Zalapahed has has several daughters who, um, you know, who because they are daughters, and there's no there's no law laid down. For their inheritance rights, <clears throat> and uh, and so uh, God allows the, the, the daughters of Zelophehad to to inherit the uh, the land that is that was given to their father. Um, and in in doing so, uh, they can pass that on to their sons later on. Um, so anyway, but but it's interesting because that yes, uh, here we have in, in the people among the people of God. I guess women have property rights or can have property rights. That's not a you know, that, that would have been unheard of in, in, in most of the nations around them, possibly with the exception of maybe Egypt. Egypt would have, uh, would have allowed the daughters of Pharaoh to own property and land, <clears throat> but, um, but not just among the normal, average, everyday people. Well, anyway, the, the, the next thing, probably the last thing we'll talk about today is that of the cities of refuge. And what's interesting about this is, you know, they have begun to sort of inhabit the land on the east side of the Jordan. They haven't crossed over to the promised land yet. Um, but uh, as they're inhabiting this land, they, they begin to, they, they begin to, um, God begins to cast a vision to them about how things should be governed once they come into the land that God is giving them. And he says to them that when you come to the land, you, you're to uh, set aside certain cities as cities of refuge. Um, and basically, what cities of refuge are uh, are places to where people can flee if they have if they have inadvertently uh, killed someone. So, so he, the idea here is that um, if someone kills another person, but it was not done intentionally, maybe it was an accident. You know, this is sort of like you know in a, in today's day and age. Uh, you know, if you get involved in a car accident. And someone in that accident dies, and you're at fault for that accident. Yes, it's a it, it is a homicide. The person is dead, uh, but it's an accidental. It's not something that that the law will hold you to the same way that it will hold you to, <clears throat> let's say, a, a premeditated first degree murder. Those are two totally different things. Uh, you didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. You you wish you could take it back. You wish it never would have happened. That uh, wasn't you know it wasn't something you were intending to do. So. 
Um, so that is what's going on in this situation. That's the situation that's being considered with the cities of refuge. But still, even if you accidentally kill somebody, it's possible that some of their next of kin might be pursuing you in order to avenge the blood of their, of their, of their uh, family member. And so they're, they're chasing you, they're chasing you. Um, if you can make it to a city of refuge, um, and you make it into the cities of, uh, into a city of refuge, you, then, then the judges of that city will, will hear your case. And if they determine that your case is valid, that you this was an accidental death, then you will be protected within, within the, the, the walls of the city of refuge. Um, now, if you go outside the walls, if you go outside to do something, then there, there's nothing they can do. There's a, only a certain boundary of jurisdiction here, right? But if, you, if your case is judged, you are not guilty of premeditated murder, then the avenger of blood, the person that is the, uh, the next of kin that is seeking your life, can't, will not be allowed to harm you. And you'll be, you'll be able to move freely within the city of refuge. And as long as you remain there, you'll be safe. Now, you're to remain there for a period of years that equal to the, the death of the high priest. So once the high priest dies, now think about that for a moment. Once the high priest die, dies, you are free to go. You can leave. Uh, and the, the avenger of blood can no longer, uh, can no longer execute, kill you in vengeance. If they do, then they will be, they will be killed. They will take their own blood upon themselves They're on their own hands. So, so, but think about the significance of this, the sort of uh, typological significance of this. <clears throat> you, you, you've committed a crime that is, that, that, is, uh, normally guilt, uh, that is normally punishable by capital punishment, by the taking of your own life. You've committed this crime. You're guilty. You, you, it happened. So what do you do? Well, you flee to, to the one who, who, who alone can give you refuge. So you go to, re you, you go to the city of refuge, and you are to stay there until what? Well, until the high priest dies. Who is our high priest? Who is the, who is the high priest uh, of, of the church? Well, it's Jesus. And think about, the, the, think about what this means. When the high priest dies, you're free. You can go. You can leave the city of refuge. You no longer have to be walled in. You no longer have to live here and here alone. You can go outside of the city now. And you can pursue, uh, you're free to pursue the, the, the rest of your life. And isn't, it, isn't that what happened to us? Our high priest has died, and yet he lives again. And his death is what brought us, bought us our freedom from this, from this walled in existence, from this incarceration. Um, we no longer, the, the avenger of blood can no longer have a claim against us, even though we were guilty. Even though we we did what was what what we were charged with, nevertheless the high priest has died, and therefore we are set free. Uh, that is a, a picture of the gospel in in the book of Numbers. Well, this has been the book of Numbers, and we we, we uh, we're going to leave it off uh, there, uh, and we're going to pick up we're going to pick up Deuteronomy next week, uh, where we will see that the people that the old generation has passed. The new generation is getting ready to go and, 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 uh, and claim the promised land for their own. And God is going to give them a second reading of the law to this new generation to make sure that they know what to do once they get into the land. Well, that is, that's all that we have for today. May God bless you uh, in your studies. Continue, uh, continue on in your studies, and we will, we will talk to you next week. Thank you very much, and God bless. Goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.